The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Greetings and welcome to 507 Biochemistry Online. I'm Dr. Bogdan Federlich. Let's metabolize some problems. Today, we're going to be talking about problem one of problem set seven. Now, this is a problem we are chasing labels through biochemical pathways. Although it sounds funny, it's actually one of the established ways through which we can test whether the mechanism we propose for these pathways is in fact consistent with what we observe inside the cells. In part A of this problem, we're going to be looking at glycogen and try to figure out which carbons in glycogen end up being lost as CO2 in the pyruvate dehydrogenase step of the metabolism. Here is a shorthand representation of glycogen. As you know, glycogen is a polymer formed of glucose monomers. Here is a cyclic form of glucose, and in glycogen we have these 1,4 linkages as shown here. Occasionally we'll have 1,6 linkages, as in the case for branches, but for simplicity, we're not going to represent them here. Now, we want to figure out which one of these carbons in glycogen, and we can label them starting from here, one, two, three, four, five, and six, which one of these carbons is going to be lost as CO2 in the pyruvate dehydrogenase step. Now, let's take a look at the pyruvate dehydrogenase reaction. As you remember, one of the endings of glycolysis is the pyruvate dehydrogenase reaction, in which pyruvate loses a CO2 molecules and forms acetyl-CoA, which later can enter the TCA cycle. Now, this carbon in the carboxyl group of pyruvate, I'm going to label it as a red dot, this is the carbon that be, is being lost as CO2. So we want to find out which of the carbons in our glycogen molecule ends up being this red dotted carbon that's being lost as CO2. To figure this out, we have to backtrack from pyruvate all the way to the beginning of glycolysis to figure out where this carbon is coming from. Shown here is a layout of the entire glycolysis pathways starting from glycogen. Let me walk you through it very quickly. Glycogen, shown here, we've shown only a couple of monomers attached to the glycogenin protein. It's going to get hydrolyzed by glycogen phosphorylase to form glucose 1-phosphate, which then mutates to glucose 6-phosphate, shown here, and then becomes fructose 6-phosphate, fructose 1-6-bisphosphate, then the aldolase reaction splits it into dihydroacetone phosphate and glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, or GAP, then the gap dehydrogenase converts it to 1 to 3 bisphosphoglycerate, and then we go down 3 phosphoglycerate, 2 phosphoglycerate, phosphoenol pyruvate, and finally pyruvate. And here I've also written the pyruvate dehydrogenase reaction. Pyruvate becomes acetyl CoA by losing the CO2. Once again, this carbon that's lost the CO2 is the carbon that we want to track. So we're going to put a red dot on it, and as we just said, this carbon is the carboxyl group in the pyruvate. So the way to solve this problem is basically go backward through the pathway and figure out where this carbon is coming from in the original glycogen molecule. For, the, for these couple of steps, it's pretty clear. It's going to be the carboxyl in each one of these molecules all the way to 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate, right there. All right, so now this 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate is coming from GAP, so this carbon is, in fact, the aldehyde carbon in GAP. Now, as you guys know, triose isomerase interconverts between dihydroacetone phosphate and GAP. So this carbon in dihydroacetone phosphate is actually this carbon, right? Because the phosphate group is going to stay unchanged, and then the car carbonyl group at C2 can interconvert with C1 to form an aldehyde here. So any of these two carbons, if they were 
labeled, they would end up being lost as CO2 in the pyruvate dehydrogenase step. Now, if we go backwards in the aldolase reaction, GAP and DHAP, when put together, these carbons are going to be carbons 3 and 4. So we're calling here 1, 2, 3. This is a carbon that comes from dihydroacetone phosphate, and this is a carbon that comes from GAP. So carbons 3 and 4. And obviously they're going to be staying carbons 3 and 4 all the way back to glucose. 1, 2, 3, and 4 right there. And also in glucose, 1 phosphate, and consequently in glycogen as well. So to answer part one, uh, we can now write here that carbons three and four of glycogen are going to be lost at the pyruvate dehydrogenase step as carbon dioxide. Part B of the problem deals with the metabolism of glycerol. As you know, glycerol is formed by the hydrolysis of triacylglycerides. Now we are asked to trace a label from the C2 carbon of glycerol all the way to the first step in which this carbon is lost as carbon dioxide. Let's first take a look at the metabolism of glycerol. As I've shown here, triacylglycerides can be hydrolyzed to form glycerol, which is 1, 2, 3 propane triol. Now, as you know, glycerol is metabolized in two steps. First, we have a glycerol kinase that's going to form a glycerol 3-phosphate, as shown here. And then we're going to use a dehydrogenase that uses NAD to oxidize the second carbon of glycerol to dihydroacetone phosphate. Then it can enter glycolysis very conveniently right here. And then it's going to continue getting metabolized towards pyruvate and acetyl-CoA, as, as we've seen before. Now, the second carbon in glycerol is C2 right here. I'm going to mark it with a blue square. So this carbon is right here, and it's going to end up right there. Now, this second carbon in dihydrastone phosphate is going to be the second carbon in GAP, and then second carbon here, here, here. Isn't this fun? Then the second carbon in pyruvate. Now, once the pyruvate decarboxylates, then it's going to be the carbonyl of acetyl-CoA. It's this carbon right here. Now, so far, this carbon has followed the metabolic pathway, but it has not left yet, right, as CO2. Now, what happens to acetyl-CoA? It's going to enter the TCA cycle. Now, let's take a look at the TCA cycle. As we just said, we're looking now at the carbon, the first carbon in acetyl-CoA here, the carbon that has the carbonyl group on. So, as I've shown here in the TCA cycle, the, the two carbons in acetyl-CoA are marked with this red line, and they will enter uh, and combine with oxaloacetate to form citrate. Then citrate isomerizes to isocitrate. Then we're going to lose a CO2 molecule, which is this middle guy, to form alpha-ketoglutarate. But notice, the two carbons from acetyl-CoA are still in the molecule. Then we're going to lose another CO2, is this bottom one, to form succinyl-CoA. But once again, the two carbons that came from acetyl-CoA are still here. So in the first TCA cycle, none of these CO2 will contain the label that came from the, from the glycerol. Now, as we go through the, to the TCA cycle, we reach this step where it's succinate. Now, here I stop putting this red mark because succinate is a symmetric molecule. So therefore, if these two carbons were coming from acetyl-CoA, at this point, they will scramble. So we won't be able to tell whether it was these two carbons or these two carbons. All right, now let me backtrack and put in the labels. So acetyl-CoA, we have this carbon came from the C2 of glycerol. So we'll find it in this carbon, this carbon, this carbon, this carbon. All right, now we get to the succinate step and we said, well, it was here. This would be the carbon that corresponds to 
succinyl-CoA. But because this molecule is symmetric, by the time we get to the malate step to add this hydroxyl group, it's going to be to the carbon next to the label or the carbon further from the label. Now, because the molecule is symmetric, we can't, the, the fumarase enzyme cannot tell which carbon was labeled and which wasn't. So therefore, malate is going to be, half of the molecules is going to have the label on this carbon and half is going to have the label on this carbon. So I'm going to write like one half square and one half square. Similarly, when we get to oxaloacetate, the label is distributed half on one uh, carboxyl group and the other half is going to be on the other carboxyl group. All right, now, so we've gone through the TCA cycle once and we have not lost the carbon that came from the glycerol. But look what happens when we continue the TCA cycle a second time. So now let's say we combine with an acetyl-CoA that doesn't have any label at all. Now these two carboxyl groups are going to be these two carboxyl group in citrate. And as we discussed, both of these two groups are going to be lost as CO2 in these two steps. First is the middle carboxyl group that's lo being lost here, and this other carboxyl is going to be lost at the alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase step. So the second time we go through the TCA cycle, we lose half of the label at the isocitrate dehydrogenase step and half of the label at the alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase step. All right? So I can, I'm going to circle these. So to answer part B, the C2 carbon of glycerol is going to be lost as CO2 in the TCA cycle, but we have to go once through the cycle first, through which none of the label will be lost, and then at the second time, first in the isocitrate dehydrogenase, then at the alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase, we're going to be losing the CO2 that came from the C2 carbon of glycerol. As you might imagine, glycerol can also be used to produce energy. In fact, some bacteria can grow on glycerol using no other carbon source. Now in part C of the problem, we're going to explore how much energy we can get from one molecule of glycerol. Let's first review the metabolism of glycerol. As we just discussed, glycerol enters metabolism with glycerol kinase, which then in two steps becomes dihydroestone phosphate, which can enter glycolysis all the way to pyruvate, and then acetyl-CoA. Here, the pyruvate dehydrogenase allows us to lose one CO2, and then acetyl-CoA will enter the TCA cycle, where within one cycle we're going to lose two more CO2s. So that's a total of three carbons that we lose, and that's exactly how many carbons we have in glycerol. Now, what we need to keep track in order to evaluate how much energy we get from one molecule of glycerol is whenever we need to use ATP, for example, we need to put in energy, or whenever we generate NADH or FADH2 molecules that we can then take to the electron transport chain and generate ATPs out of them. So I've put together a list of the steps in the pathway where the energy balance is affected. Either we need to use energy or we're generating energy in the form of ATP or in the form of redox cofactors such as NAD and FAD. All right, so the first step, glycerol kinase, we're going to need to spend one molecule of ATP. So I'm going to put a minus one here for ATP equivalence. Now, in the glycerol 3-phosphate dehydrogenase step, which is shown right here, we're generating one molecule of NADH. So, plus one NADH. Now, for the purpose of this problem, we're going to use the convention that one NADH is worth about three ATP equivalents. Now, later on in the pathway, we're going to get to the gap DH step where we generate one more NADH molecule. So gap DH, another NADH molecule, that's equivalent to three ATPs. Now, as we're moving ahead, we have the phosphoglycerate uh, kinase step where we generate one ATP, and then we have the pyruvate kinase step where we generate one more I ATP. I have these written here. So plus one ATP and plus one ATP. Now, 
Finally, we know the pyruvate is going to be decarboxylated by the pyruvate dehydrogenase, and here too we're generating 1 NADH. So plus 1 NADH, that's going to be equivalent to 3 ATPs. All right, and finally, the TCA cycle. Now we have one molecule of acetyl-CoA that enters the TCA cycle. So, as you guys know, for every molecule of acetyl-CoA that enters the TCA cycle, we're going to be generating one, two, three NADHs, one FADH2, and one GTP. So the tally is three NADH, one FADH2, and one GTP. Now, GTP is equivalent to an ATP. FADH2 counts as two ATPs, and NADH counts as three ATPs. So that's a grand total of 12 ATPs. So putting all of this together for one molecule of glycerol, when fully metabolized to CO2, we get 22 ATP equivalents. So that's the final answer for part C. From one molecule of glycerol, we get about 22 ATP equivalents. In part D of the problem, we're tracing the same labels we had in part A, but instead of tracing them to CO2, we're going to trace them to the amino acid alanine. As you know, one way to produce alanine is by transamination from pyruvate. Since we already tracked the label to pyruvate, we need to know how do we convert pyruvate into alanine. Let's take a look at that reaction. As you know, alpha keto acids such as pyruvate can be converted into amino acids by a transamination reaction. Here, we're going to use another amino acid to donate the amino group to the alpha keto acid pyruvate to form alanine. Now, all these transamination reactions are catalyzed by PLP, or pyridoxal 5-phosphate, which is a cofactor derived from vitamin B6. So what is left to write in this transformation is the other pair of amino acid, alpha keto acid. So basically, where is this amino group coming from? Typically, for most transaminases, the other pair is glutamate alpha ketoglutarate. So we're going to have glutamate, it's going to donate the amino group, and in the process, going to become an alpha keto acid, alpha ketoglutarate. So in this way, pyruvate becomes alanine. Now, we were tracking the label from this carbon. So the carbon that will be lost as CO2 in the pyruvate dehydrogenase reaction. So that is this carbon right here in pyruvate. So in the transamination reaction, this carbon becomes the carboxyl carbon of alanine. So if you were to start with a glycogen that was labeled at the 3 or 4, uh, the carbons 3 and 4, that label would be lost as CO2 in the pyruvate dehydrogenase reaction, as we saw in part A, but also that label will be incorporated in alanine at the carboxyl group of this amino acid. Parts E and F of the problem deal with chasing labels to the amino acids glutamate and aspartate. Now, both of these amino acids have their corresponding alpha keto acids as part of the TCA cycle. So let's first take a look at this TCA cycle. Here we have the TCA cycle, where I highlighted uh, alpha ketoglutarate going into glutamate through a transamination reaction. Alpha ketoglutarate and alpha keto acid can undergo a PLP catalyzed transamination to form glutamate. And similarly, oxaloacetate, another alpha keto acid, can transaminate to form aspartate. Now, in part B of the problem, we're looking at the label present at carbon 1 in acetyl-CoA. And we said that this label will stay inside the intermediates of the TCA cycle for a whole round. Now, when this label gets the alpha ketoglutarate, it's going to be on this carboxyl group. So in the transamination reaction, the label is going to end completely on the furthermost carboxyl in glutamate. So that takes care of part E. Now, if we continue 
uh, chasing this label. Once we get to the succinate, the label is going to split half and half between these two carboxyl groups because we cannot tell uh, which one, because the molecule is going to be symmetric. Similarly for fumarate and in malate as well. So in oxaloacetate, the label is going to be on both of the carboxyl group. Half of the molecules will have it on one, half of the molecules will have it on the other. So therefore, the aspartate is going to mirror that label distribution, half label on one carboxyl, half label on the other carboxyl. So that should answer the final part of this problem. Now, I hope this problem gave you a better understanding of what it means to chase labels to biochemical pathways. And also, that chasing labels can help us better understand the mechanisms of biochemical transformations.